Joseph was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph was elevated by Pharaoh to be the governor of Egypt. And Pharaoh gave him a wife. Her name was Asenath, and she was the daughter of the priest of On, more typically called Heliopolis. Now, Gary Sturman has written an article about Asenath called The Mystery of Joseph's Egyptian Wife. And we're going to talk about it on today's Prophecy in the News. May I say that the article appears in our February edition of Prophecy in the News magazine. Gary's going to talk about this symbol of the woman throughout the scriptures and throughout history. Um, I guess beginning with uh, uh, Asenath, maybe going back to the Garden of Eden and ending up with Mystery Babylon. It's going to be a fascinating subject. Gary, tell mm -hmm. us about Asenath. Well, J.R., we've got a lot to talk about today because uh, we're going to be talking about Egypt and Joseph's tour in Egypt, if you will, from prison to absolute power under Pharaoh. And, and J.R., Egypt in the Bible is a type of the system of the world, that is, this evil, satanic world system. That's, uh, Egypt is the very symbol of that. In Genesis 41-44, we have Pharaoh saying this, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or his foot in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh put Joseph in power. In uh, charge. Absolutely in charge of the land. The verse 45 says, and Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnat Paaneah, and he gave to him, him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, and Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. In other words, he became the governor of the land of Egypt with a wife who was the daughter of the high priest. Now, J.R., when you think of the high mm. priest of Egypt, that's not very Christian. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That, that was the pagan religion of Egypt. Yes. And as Heliopolis, of course, is the city of the sun. Right. Helios meaning sun. And so he was primarily a worshiper of the sun god. Yes, he was. And his wife, by the way, is called Asenath or Asenath. And in Coptic Egyptian, that name flatly means she who is of Neath. That is, at birth, her father gave her the mm -hmm. name uh, Asenath, which means I'm devoting you or placing you uh, under the protection of the goddess Neith. So right from her very birth, Joseph's wife became a pagan daughter of yeah. Egypt. So tell us about Neith. Who, who is Neith and uh, what's the meaning behind that? Well, Neith is a, uh, the goddess of the Egyptian city of Sais, which in that day was the capital of Egypt back in the 8th dynasty. Now, uh, that is the 8th century B.C., the, and, and Neith was a pagan uh, goddess who protected the city of Sais. She stood up as a protectress, and, and so the Egyptians viewed her as a strong, powerful warrior goddess. Now, history tells us that Neith and the goddess Athena were exactly the same. Uh, Athena protected the city of Athens. Uh, and similarly, and, and a little bit later, after Athena, came Minerva, the, god, uh, the goddess that protected the city of Rome. So Neith is a type of a protector goddess. She stands over a city and protects it, and the people uh, pay homage to her figure, to her name. Uh, they would give money to her if, in a way. They would tithe to this goddess in order to keep uh, blessing and protection in the city. And actually, the city became of a, a feminine mystique. Right. Uh, when we speak of cities today, we speak of she. Yes, we do. You know, in, in the feminine form. When we speak of planet Earth, we speak of her uh, in the feminine form. Mm -hmm. uh, Mother Nature is in the feminine form. And so this, this idea of the woman protector of the city is more like a, a mother protecting her children, isn't it? Absolutely. And this whole 
concept of the Earth Mother distilled down into the goddess goes back to Nimrod. Uh, Nimrod was documented in scripture as the man who originated the system of the worship of gods and goddesses, Baal and Ishtar. Uh, Ishtar became the Ashtoreth of, of the Canaanites. Uh, Ashtoreth was a fertility goddess and pe people came and worshiped her in those little groves and, and uh, Ashtoreth and various imitators of Ashtoreth became the protectors of the Canaanites. And by the way, when Israel apostatized uh, later on, and took up the worship of Ashtoreth themselves, mm -hmm. even to the point that they would commit the, their children to Ashtoreth. Uh, so again, you have this goddess principle being thought of as she who protects and provides for us. Mm -hmm. JR, that's absolutely 180 degrees opposed to the biblical model, which is that Jehovah God is our provider and our protector. Uh, one of his names, El Shaddai, is the name that he put over the house of Israel. Uh, El Shaddai means he who preserves and protects and provides for. And, and he is a he, not a she. Yeah. So you had Israel divided basically into two camps, those who followed El Shaddai and then those who through apostasy began to move over toward the goddess. Now, Moses did not miss this opportunity to go back to the Garden of Eden and explain to us that Eve was deceived by the serpent. Yep. And so the Lord told uh, Adam and Eve that uh, uh, she would try to rule over him, but that he would succeed in ruling over her or something to that effect. Tell uh, us about well, that. Well, back in, in uh, Genesis 3:15 and, and 16, you have what has been called the oldest prophecy in the Bible in, in which God cursed the serpent for having tempted Eve. <clears throat> and to the woman, the Lord says, I will put, or to the serpent, he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Fascinating concept in and of itself because the, the serpent and the woman could be thought of as confederates, if you will, in sin. But God says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Um, and of course, that's a huge prophecy. That's mm -hmm. the, the messianic prophecy. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and, uh, th and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Uh, the literal Hebrew says, thy desire shall be to rule over thy husband, but he shall rule over thee. Uh, so there you have in Genesis 3.16 the origin of the battle of the sexes, mm -hmm. which is the source of, I guess, what is it? They say love makes the world go around. Uh, in our era, it's sitcoms make the world go around. <laughs> You've always got the battle of the sexes, men yeah. and women going head to head. But it really dates back to Genesis 3.16. Uh, Adam became the redeemer of Eve. Indeed. The, the New Testament tells us that Eve was deceived, but Adam wasn't. Adam knew what he was doing. And he partook of the forbidden fruit in order to take her sin upon himself, thus bringing both of them down to the place where they could both be redeemed, where she could be redeemed, and Adam could be redeemed too. It's, it's something that, uh, uh, that he felt he needed to do in order to save her because she had sinned. Mm. So he brought the whole human race down and uh, became thus her redeemer by identifying with her sin. Well, you know, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ did, so to speak. He came down to this earth and he who knew no sin became sin for us. He became identified with our sin and he took our sin upon himself on the cross of Calvary in order to redeem us from our sins. It's a, a magnificent picture. Well, Joseph uh, was a redeemer of his wife as well, wasn't he? J.R., it's amazing. Joseph, as a type of Christ, uh, it, it's been said for a long time that uh, uh, there are over 50 similarities between the life of Joseph and the life of Christ. And, of course, one of the, the major similarities is in the fact that Joseph took a Gentile bride. In essence, what he did was he took this woman who had been devoted to the goddess and he redeemed her unto himself. And she became the mother of Ephraim and Manasseh, uh, two big names in the tribes of Israel, by the way. A lot of prophecy written concerning Ephraim and Manasseh. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that redemptive typology 
is a huge story because it takes us all the way over to the book of Revelation if you follow it completely through. So Joseph, in redeeming and marrying her, redeemed her out of idolatry. Yes. The Egyptian worship of the sun god. And um, basically brought her into the fold of the house of Israel. Right. And uh, of course Joseph is a, a figures large in uh, the nation of Israel. The rabbis have even said that a Messiah will be a son of Joseph. There will mm -hmm. be two Messiahs. One is Messiah bin Joseph. The other is Messiah bin David. And uh, so he uh, he actually become uh, be, being a type of Christ takes this Gentile pride. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came to this earth the, in His first advent 2,000 years ago, died on Calvary in order to take a Gentile bride. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. Their eyes were blinded. Their spiritual ears were deafened, as God told Isaiah it would be. And because of the falling of the Jews, the Gentiles, had the opportunity to be saved. So, here we've got all the cities of the world, which by the way were fortresses. They were all fortified with big walls to mm -hmm. protect them from enemies, and towers periodical, uh, per periodically set around the city. Uh, it was a fortified city, and that became the view of the cities, and they took on a feminine mystique about them, and it is our job with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to go into all the world, beginning at Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, going to the cities and redeem the people. <laughs> J.R., this theme is so uh, woven into Scripture that it's astounding. For example, in the 16th chapter of Acts, when Paul and the others go to the city of Ephesus, uh, they encounter a cult there. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world was this great temple of Diana yes. of the Ephesians. Diana of the Ephesians is one of the identities of the ancient Neith. Uh, she's a municipal goddess who protects the city of Ephesus. Uh, she is depicted with a, with a tower upon her head, a little fortress tower. Mm -hmm. It's called the Goddess of Fortresses. And it looked like it's made of brick or rock or stone yeah. or something like that. It's, it wasn't did. just a fancy hat. Oh, no. It was actually looked like a tower. And so she, as a fortress goddess, was the protector of the city of Ephesus in this fabulously beautiful temple, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. I wonder why it is that Paul spent two years of his life in Ephesus. I wonder why it is that, that the Apostle John became bishop of the church in Ephesus. Yes. God sent those men right into, if you will, the heart of the beast. Right into the heart of <laughs> Diana's territory. <laughs> That's right. And he wrote the book of Revelation with Mystery Babylon. You suppose Diana had something to do with his <laughs> inspiration? I think so. I think uh, so. Oh, yes. In fact, Mystery Babylon is called that great city. <laughs> Right. There it is. It's so, amazing, this and, and, goddess figure. And what's amazing, J.R., is that if you begin to look at this aspect of the Bible, this is a very rich part of Bible prophecy. Uh, it gives you a great deal of insight into the, the uh, discernment of what one of the greatest mysteries of the Bible, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother mm -hmm. of harlots. Now, starting back in the days of Nimrod, you had the goddess mother. She was called Astarte. She was called Ishtar. In Egypt, she was called Isis. Uh, in Asia Minor, she was called uh, Sibylle. Uh, in Rome, she was called Fortuna. Uh, Ceres was one of her names. In Greece, this mother goddess figure uh, then became the parent of the municipal protector goddess. And that would be Neith and Athena and Minerva and J.R., there's a big rest of the story because we haven't yeah. talked about the latest incarnation of the goddess, but we'll get there in just a minute. You remember Rahab? She was a harlot, and her house was on the wall of the fortress of Jericho. She may have been a, one of the big reasons why Jericho was there because of plying her trade. She was a harlot. And if you will notice, 
a member, Solomon, a member, not Solomon, but S-A-L-M-O-N, Solomon of the royal house of Judah took her as his wife. He redeemed her. And she became the mother of Boaz, who married Ruth. <laughs> and from Ruth came Ovid. Ovid uh, married and had a son named, uh, uh, well, uh, David's father. Um, I can't remember his name. Having a, a slight mental block, yes. and I understand yes. that. getting old. <laughs> but anyway, here we've got Boaz, Ovid, ah, Jesse. <laughs> Thank it. you. Jesse and David. So we have, you know, Boaz was the seventh generation from Judah. And he was the son of Rahab, the harlot of Jericho. So this idea of redeeming the harlot or redeeming the, the, uh, the wife or, or the, the woman, mm -hmm. redeeming the fallen woman, Gary, right. is the message throughout the Bible. That's why, uh, that's why Israel was called the wife of Jehovah. Right. She was a fallen woman. And that's the reason why the church is called the bride of Christ. And this is a mystical union. We don't understand it all, but to me, it's, it's the saving of the fallen woman from the Garden of Eden all the way through until the rapture and Jesus comes back. As soon as he destroys Mr. Babylon, we see Jesus coming back in power and great glory. And who's with him? His wife. <laughs> His wife is with him. Well, J.R., back in the old days of Rome, Ovid referred to Minerva as the goddess of a thousand works. Plato wrote about Neith, uh, again, the goddess for whom Joseph's uh, wife is named. Plato says in Egypt, in that part of the delta where the stream of the Nile divides around the vertex, there is a city, a district called the Sciatic. Uh, the most important uh, city of this district is Sais from whence came King Amasis, writes Plato. The city was founded by a goddess whose name is Neith in Egyptian. And according to the people there, she's called Athena in Greek. They're very friendly to Athens and claim to be related to our people somehow or other. So <laughs> here's Plato back here. Wow. Writing about the goddess. Yes. <laughs> and the fact that the people of his, his city, state, yeah. uh, nation, were kin to those folks over right. there. That's kind of interesting. It is amazing. <laughs> now, here we, we get into something I find uh, fascinating because uh, when we get into the goddess, J.R., she does not disappear at all. As we get into the medieval era, moving on into the modern era, she pops mm -hmm. up again. In just a second, we're going to tell you yeah. how. When Nimrod uh, established this goddess worship, he was probably looking at those goddesses, uh, those human women who became goddesses having married those fallen angels. So, yeah, really, and what you're saying, and it's true that the, uh, the world system is founded on that uh, false goddess worship that was brought by the Nephilim, uh, the battle of the gods, the tight uh, battling uh, with the Olympians, yes. the, the women, goddesses, uh, constantly tr seeking to curry favor with the gods of heaven. All those ancient myths basically uh, form a foundation of the system of Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, still alive and well today. And J.R., here's an example of how uh, Minerva still lives. Uh, another name for Minerva is Europa. Yes. Europa was a Mycenaean uh, goddess, and she was abducted by Zeus in the form of a bull. Now, uh, we have Europa evolving into the goddess protector of Europe. You will find her statue uh, in the front of the European Parliament building in Strasbourg and in front of the European Union headquarters in Brussels, Belgium. You'll find stat uh, statues of Europa. And riding the bull, even. Riding the bull. Yes. And, and J.R., this takes us right to Revelation and the woman and the beast. Absolutely. <laughs> but what's this Europa doing as a protector goddess of Europe? One could make the case that she's doing exactly the same thing as another protector goddess uh, she's named after Columba, which is Latin for the dove, 
but we call her by another name. We call her Columbia. Mm -hmm. And maybe you've gone to the movies and seen, uh, <laughs> seen that movie opening with a goddess yeah. standing up and holding a torch and all those stars mm -hmm. shining around her. And then right at the bottom it says Columbia Pictures. Well, that's the picture of that goddess we're talking about. J.R., she wears a Roman toga and she stands in New York Harbor and she holds yes. up a torch. And she's called the goddess of liberty, but essentially, if you go back and look at the history of her foundation, she is none other than an incarnation of Neith Athena Minerva. It's mm -hmm. the same goddess with a different name. Well, let's talk about Washington, D.C., our beloved capital. Yes. You will not find a statue of Jesus or Moses or Solomon or any of the biblical characters. You will find a statue of liberty. Yeah. Sitting right atop the dome of the Capitol building. And uh, so this, idea, and by the way, inside the dome of the Capitol building are all these Greek gods and goddesses that are standing beside each of our founding fathers. Mm. You will not find Jesus there or any Christian symbol. Fascinating. Well, J.R., she presides from the Capitol dome, this goddess Columbia, and her district is called Columbia. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be pretty dense not to get the significance of yeah, that. Washington, D.C., the D.C. stands for District, District of Columbia. of Columbia. And she is the one who gazes over the whole city and gives her protection to it, just as Athena stood over the city of Athens, just mm -hmm. as Neith stood over the city of Sais in ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. J.R., it's the same thing. It's alive and well, and she's called officially, our, uh, our government refers to the lady on the Capitol Dome as Lady Freedom. Uh, and I quote, the bronze statue of freedom by Thomas Crawford is the crowning figure of the dome of the United States Capitol. Uh, the statue is a classical female figure of freedom, wearing flowing draperies. Let's just call it what it is, wearing a toga. <clears throat> yeah, a Roman toga. A Roman toga. <laughs> <laughs> her right hand rests upon the hilt of the sheathed sword. Her left hand holds a laurel wreath of victory and shield of the United States with 13 stripes. Her helmet is encircled by stars and, and features a crest composed of an eagle's head, feathers, talons, a reference to the costume of Native Americans. A brooch uh, inscribed U.S. secures her fringed robes, that is a toga, and she stands on a cast iron globe, that is she's standing on the world, okay? Mm -hmm. That's an easy yeah. symbol to, yeah, to she's interpret. She's a goddess of the world. Goddess of the world. Mm -hmm. And of course her motto is E Pluribus Unum, the national motto of the United States. And she is surrounded by the, the symbols of Roman power, such as the fasces, the, the bundle of sticks, and the hatchet. Uh, all of the, the, uh, the toga, uh, the helmet, the sword, everything mm -hmm. takes us right back to Minerva, right yeah. back to Neith. Yeah. J.R., the goddess is alive and well. Now you recall how Christians tried to take over the government in the last 40 years or so, and how we have so miserably failed. Because every time we get somebody in there that we think is going to be a dedicated Christian and do things ethically and morally correct, they, they fail us. Yes. And uh, so we are called of God to bring out of her a people for His name. We are not there to save her, but people out. So I, I want to list, I, I want to read to you from Revelation. Now this does not mean that it's the United States, but it says, come out of her, my people. And that's what we're trying to do, winning souls to Jesus. Well, it's a fascinating program, Gary. This is J.R. Church and Gary Stimmen. Until next time, keep looking up.